Number 63, Integrated Concepts. A toy gun uses a spring with a force constant of 300 newtons per meter to propel a 10 gram steel ball. If the spring is compressed 7 centimeters and friction is negligible, letter A, how much force is needed to compress the spring? All right, so for letter A, it's actually fairly straightforward. There's a very nice formula uh, that we can use. It says the force applied uh, to compress a string is equal to negative the spring constant or the force constant multiplied by the distance of compression. So the force needed here uh, to compress the spring will be equal to the negative of the spring constant or the force constant, right, which is 300 newtons per meter. It's negative 300 multiplied then by the uh, distance of compression, right? And it says it's compressed in the problem seven centimeters, but remember we need it in terms of meters. So we can just simply take the seven centimeters, divide it by 100, and that would be the value in terms of meters. So just plug it into the calculator. So 300 times seven divided by 100, and we get a value of negative 21, right? So the negative 21 newtons, all right. So that's the force needed to compress the spring. And then, um, well, let's take a look at letter B and see what happens next. We'll talk about that negative sign in a second. So it says, to what maximum height can the ball be shot? Okay, so now if we think about, so for letter B, let's change the color. So we're trying to figure out the maximum height, right, that this ball can be shot. So we notice that on the right-hand side, right, if we're dealing with energy, we're probably going to be talking about this potential energy formula over here. Right, so the potential energy uh, will equal the mass multiplied by gravity multiplied by the height that the object uh, reaches eventually. So the question is, how do I connect um, the spring energy? Okay, because that's really what I need to do. I need to connect the spring energy to the potential energy. So actually, if you look on the right-hand side, guys, bottom right, we do have a formula that talks about the potential energy of a spring aka the potential energy of, elast of elasticity. So what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to substitute in one half kx squared in for the potential energy in this formula. Why? Because they're equal. The potential energy that is stored within a spring is the same energy as uh, the potential energy of gravity because the spring energy will be converted to gravitational energy after, if I were to draw a little picture, after this ball, okay, gets released, right? When the spring finally uh, uncompresses, right, or lengthens, the ball is then shot up, okay? So it's up here somewhere. So all the energy that was in the spring here is now going to be in the ball at the top of its height, all right? So that's why they're equal. So now, again, I'm simply for potential energy here, I'm gonna plug in one half, one half kx squared, is equal to mgh. And again, I wanna solve for height, right? So let's just simply divide out the uh, mg from both sides. All right, mg. And we have a lovely little formula here that says that the height is basically going to be uh, one half, right? Kx squared all over mg. So now all we really need to do is just plug in the values because we have everything, right? And we can solve. So the height here is gonna be one half times the force constant, 300. Right, times the displacement. Now remember that has to be in terms of meters. I can plug in my 700, excuse me, my seven over 100, or I can just simply move that decimal two places to the left. All right, so this would be the value in terms of meters. If you were to throw this into the calculator, this is what you would get. So now we'll divide that by then the mass of the ball. And it's, of course, they gave it to us in grams, right? So remember it has to be in terms of kilograms. So divide this value by 1000 or simply move that decimal place three places to the left. All right, so you're gonna to have to add a zero there essentially. So zero, one, zero, and that would be it now in terms of kilograms and then multiply by gravity, which is 9.80. And now all we have to do is calculate, right? So 0.5 uh, times 300 times 0 0.07 divided by 0 0.01 times 9.8. Oop. Forgot to, I'm looking at the number, I'm like, that sounds a little too big. Don't forget to square it, like I almost did, right? Don't forget to carry that square, ladies and gentlemen. I was just seeing if you were paying attention, that's all, right? So one half times 300 times 0 0.07 squared divided by 0 0.01 times 9.8. Okay, that sounds a lot more reasonable. 
so 7.5. All right, so the height obtained uh, by the ball here will be 7.5 meters. Great, and that would be then the answer for letter B. So now let's take a look at letter C. Uh, at what angles above the horizontal may a child aim to hit a target three meters away at the same height as the gun? So this actually brings us back to uh, kinematics, right? Um, we have to remember, right, that we're basically trying to find an angle, right, of firing, and it's telling us a certain range, okay? And we're then asked, yeah, we're asked to then find the angle. So uh, recall this formula. This formula was very nice. It says that the range is equal to the initial velocity squared, not in any particular direction, but the overall resultant initial velocity, multiplied by the sine, all right, of two times the initial angle, all over g. All right, so basically if I had my picture, let me draw it up here on the upper left, I'll just erase some of this stuff. So uh, if I had to draw a quick picture, basically what I'm looking to do is I'm looking to, here's my initial angle. This thing is being fired with some initial velocity, right, that we don't know. And the ball is gonna travel something like this. It's gonna eventually land over here. And this is the range, right? This would be the range value and that is, well, it's not really a question mark, right? They want to know the angle if the range is three meters, okay? So basically, you know, in terms of this formula here, what do I need to solve for? I need to solve for my theta, right? So why don't we just start setting that up now and let's get all the variables on over to the other side. So the G comes out of the denominator on the right, goes up into the numerator on the left. The initial velocity squared uh, leaves the numerator on the right and goes down to the denominator on the left. So basically then it would be sine of two theta, okay, is equal to range times gravity all over the initial velocity squared. Okay, so that sounds all great, right? Um, now what we need though, we're gonna realize, um, I mean from here we know that we're gonna have to do the inverse sine eventually, right? But let me just save that just so it doesn't get too crazy here with too many algebraic steps. I'm gonna start to try to figure out these numbers all right, uh, I mean, two of them I don't need to figure out, right? The range they told us is three meters and gravity is obviously uh, 9.80. So the only piece that's really left is gonna be this idea of the uh, initial velocity, right? So we have to figure out, well, how do I find uh, the initial velocity here? You know, what, what do I need to know? And so on and so forth. So we have to remember that you know, maybe I can somehow relate the initial velocity to the kinetic energy, all right? Maybe maybe I can do that, maybe I can make that relationship, right? So if we think back to the problem again, right? If I think back to the spring problem, so here's the, here's the spring, it's compressed, all right? Then what's going to happen is the spring will become uncompressed, all right? And let's say the ball is still on it, right? But it's just about to leave. Okay, just about to leave the spring. And then there's a third case, right? The third case is now when the spring is totally lengthened and the ball is in the air, okay? So in this particular case, all the energy here, all of the energy is in the potential energy of the spring, okay? All of it is tied up in this spring. As soon as now the spring is uncompressed, all right, all of this potential energy then that was stored in the spring is now released into kinetic energy that is inherent now inside of uh, the ball here. Okay, so in this ball now, at this stage, it is all kinetic energy. Okay, right before it gets released. And then, going from this point now to its highest point all the way at the top, this all of this now kinetic energy at this point is now translated into pure, at the highest point, pure potential energy. It's all potential at the top, all right? You know, so think about it. So we have these three stages, right? Letter B, I took into account, I was comparing this stage to this stage, okay? That's why I was saying all the potential energy in the spring will eventually be converted to pure potential energy due to gravity at the highest point. But for right here, if I'm looking for the initial velocity of the ball, I wanna frame the problem this way, where after the spring is compressed, or I should say this, after it's compressed, right, it's fully lengthened, all of that energy in that spring is now converted into energy of motion of the ball, okay? 
So, all right. So now, basically what I need to do, all right, is I need to um, solve this, okay, for v squared, okay? Because the, if I'm, I'm really trying to find the initial kinetic energy, and if I find the initial kinetic energy, that means I want to know the initial uh, velocity. Remember, the initial kinetic energy here is the same thing as the potential energy of the spring. Okay? So, uh, let me write this. I'm running out of room. I'll write it on the upper left. All right? So, here we have the kinetic energy is equal to 1 half mv squared. And we said that these are going to be initial. Right? So, solve for v squared. You just got to divide out the half and the m. Right? So, here we have... The initial velocity squared should be equal to uh, the kinetic energy initial, right, divided by one half times the mass. Now remember, the kinetic energy here, as I said before, is going to be the same as the potential energy in the spring. All right, so that they're literally the same thing. All right, um, so what we can do is I can now substitute in instead of kinetic energy here, I can substitute in the uh, potential energy. Of the spring. All right, so let's do that now. So this would be now, oh, I'm really running out of room. Let me erase this picture. All right, erase that picture. So now um, here we have the initial velocity squared will be equal to one half kx squared over one half, one half times m. All right, so notice the halves cancel. Okay, the halves will cancel. And now the initial velocity here. Um, where's the color? So the initial velocity will simply be, the initial velocity squared will simply be the force constant multiplied by the compression of the spring squared divided by then the mass of the ball. So this is what I'm going to now substitute in for the initial velocity here. Okay, and then we can probably calculate. So we got sine of two theta is equal to the range which was three times gravity of 9.80 divided by now kx squared over m Right, so this is kx squared over m, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in the values, okay? So it's 300. The compression of the spring, remember, in meters was 0 0.0700, right, squared, all over the mass of the ball. And the mass of the ball was 10 grams, so it was 0 0.0100 kilograms. Okay, so if we plug this all into the calculator, so we'll do... Uh, Actually, I'm going to do the denominator first, just so, because otherwise the parentheses are going to get a little nuts. So 300 times 0 0.07 squared divided by 0 0.01. And then that's 147. And now what I'm going to do is 3 times 9.8 divided by that number. So divided by that value comes out to be 0 0.2, right? And that's exactly 0 0.2. So here we have the sine then of 2 theta is equal to 0 0.2. Now we got to do the inverse sine of both sides. Right, we've got to take the inverse sine of both sides. That will get rid of the sine on the left. So that becomes 2 theta now will equal second sine of 0.2. And that works out to be now 11.5. So this is 11.55 degrees. Now this is not theta, this is 2 theta. So to solve for the two angles, it's very simple from here. Okay, what we need to do now is uh, divide, divide the two out of both si from both sides. Okay, that's the first thing. So let me first, um, I'm going to write some of the work at the top. I know I'm all over the place. Actually, on the, on the upper left. All right, so I have 2 theta is equal to 11.5 degrees. Divide out the 2 from both sides. And we realize now that theta, that one of the thetas, I should say, is going to be 5.77 or so, right? This is about 5.77 degrees, okay? And then the other theta you get by doing this. You get by taking... 90 and subtracting the value you just found here, okay, minus 5.77. So theta could also be 90 minus that value, uh, 84.2, okay, 84, 84.2. So here we have 84.2, two degrees. So these would be the two angles, okay, and you can go plug them back into this formula. You solve for the initial velocity here. All right, I already told you what the formula is, you know, um, so you can just check the work. All right, so that shouldn't be too bad. So those are the angles. 
Now um, it says, what is the guns for letter D? What is the gun's maximum range on level ground? So again, we're going to use the same, um, the uh, same formula here. Okay. Just remember that the maximum range is when the angle, right? When your angle, when your angle of release is 45 degrees, all right, above the horizontal. And that we covered back in kinematics. So here we have the same formula, right? Initial velocity squared times the sine of two times now 45 degrees all over my uh, gravitational acceleration, 9.80. What is the initial velocity squared? Well, I gave you the formula up here, so we can just plug that in, right? So this is simply the force constant, okay, which is 300 times the displacement of the spring, so 0 0.0700, all over the mass of the ball, which was 0 0.0100 multiplied by the sine of 2 times 45, sine of 90 essentially, all divided by 9.80. I'm running out of room. Sorry about that. So let's just calculate it quickly. So 300 times 0 0.07 divided by 0 0.01, uh, all divided by 9.8. And here we come up with a value of uh, 214, right? Did I? Nope. Yep, sounded too large again. I almost did the same mistake. What did I do, guys? Forgot to square this again, right? Right here. Okay, I forgot to square that. So make sure you put in that square. Always, though, check to make sure your answers make sense. Um, so this is what happens sometimes when you go a little too quickly, but everything should be fine here. Uh, so we square that value and then take that, yeah, divided by 9.8. This sounds a lot better. 15, yeah, that was way off. But notice, you forget to square that. <laughs> Look at how far off your answer will be. So this is a range of 15 then meters. That's a maximum range. All right. So guys, thank you so very much for tuning in. Complex problem, right? Integrated concepts. We're going back to kinematics. But if you take it piece by piece, it shouldn't be too bad. All right. So thank you so much uh, for tuning in. I really do appreciate your viewership very much. Please remember to subscribe. That'd be an awesome way to uh, help support us and also help us reach more students just like yourself. And um, I hope you have a great day. Take care.